Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. My name is Dave Frankowski and I'll be your moderator for today's class. And welcome to another lecture given by the Oceanside California class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. The school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given unto our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year of 1958, and we hold classes in the United States and in various other countries. The Oceanside class was established in 1994. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the Oceanside class, Dr. Dennis Volpe, and the President, Dr. Carl Emler. Now, in the school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title for the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The correct name for our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The correct, the correct title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the correct name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles. They are not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name, and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike the titles of Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. It's a divine title because it's the title that our Creator has chosen for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name, and a minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, the Greek, nor the Latin languages have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that's made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, which would make such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings for the true name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, the limits, and the bounds of everything that exists. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. And we've drawn this cloud to extend all around the edges of this chart to show that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body, and he walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, who the whole world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, 
What did they call the Savior when he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface to the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him this threefold tabernacle pattern in a vision. Later on, Yahweh instructed Moses to build one in the wilderness of Sinai, exactly like the one he had seen in his vision on the mount. The tabernacle pattern is a threefold pattern consisting of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and it operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. This school has 10 primary constitutional objectives and aims, and they are as follows. One, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern practical and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men, whereby a man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah, and ten, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah, with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. We'll begin this afternoon with a prayer by Dr. Bruce Geller from our Oceanside, California class. And we'll have a scripture read, which will be Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, and that will be read by Dr. Jerry Geller from our Oceanside, California class. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon. May we all bow our hearts and minds in a moment of prayer and let us thank our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, who has brought us together again one more time. We're so appreciative of what you have done for us, Yahweh, and what you are continuing to do for us. For one, you've taken us out of complete darkness and brought us into the light of your purpose, your pattern, and your plan. We appreciate everything that you have done for us. We ask you to continue to give us the confidence in you and the strength because we absolutely definitely need it we know we're living in perilous times but we also know that you are the overcomer and there is nothing that you can't overcome you have overcome all things and you have given us of your spirit and we're so grateful for it for this great opportunity that you've given all of us to lay hold on eternal life and immortal glorification. We just ask you to continue to be with us, continue to strengthen us, continue to always look towards you for our strength and not to, to 
be uh, concerned about the flesh, but to always look towards you in everything we do and everything that we say. And we ask that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be acceptable, Yahweh, in your eyesight, through your son, Yahshua the Messiah, who's given himself for us. And all these things we're grateful for in Yahshua the Messiah's most holy name. Let us all say, hallelujah. 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 Good evening, class. Tonight I'll be reading Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, right, revised by A.B. Trena of the Scripture Research Association, Incorporated. Ezekiel 37. The hand of Yahweh was upon me, and carried me out in the spirit of Yahweh, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Yah Yahweh, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus saith Yah Yahweh unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am Yahweh. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith Yah Yahweh, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up on their feet an exceedingly great army. And he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith Yah Yahweh, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am Yahweh, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. And I will place you in your own land, then shall ye know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, saith Yahweh. The word of Yahweh came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it, for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it, for Joseph the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel his companions and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith Yah Yahweh, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. 
and the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before thine eyes, their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith Yah Yahweh, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their Elohim. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes to do and do them. And they shall dwell in the land which I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever." Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, Yahweh, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Ezekiel 37. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Jerry Geller and Dr. Bruce Geller. Our scripture readers this afternoon will be Dr. Linda Volpe from our Oceanside, California class, and Dr. Sharon Welch from our Syracuse, New York class. Speakers be advised, you'll see a five minute sign on your screen. Please acknowledge when you've seen the sign. And for our first speaker this afternoon, we'd like to call the Dean of our Green Bay, Wisconsin class, Dr. Andy Verkaterin. Hello, everybody. Um, Hello. It's good to, good Hi, to be here. And um, when I just think of the things that Yahweh has shown me through the years of being in attendance at a school for so many years, it humbles me because I don't know where to start, what to say, because there are so many things we would love to share with you. Uh, the scripture reading, obviously, was talking about a particular subject, and I'll address that because we have so much to say about so many things. When I first came to class, um, I thought I knew something about God. I was a Christian, and I believed, you know, like most Christians, in Jesus and water baptism and all these various things. And I called the name of the Creator, the Lord, and God, and, you know, Son, and called him Jesus. And it wasn't until, until I came down here that I learned the name was Yahweh for the first time. And it really, when I heard that, it really caught me off guard because I've never heard the name before. Now, today, a lot of people have heard the name, and so it's maybe not quite as, uh, 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 quite a, as of a shock, but nonetheless, for me, it was a very big shock. And it caused me to go to the Brown County Library um, in Green Bay and to do some research, and I found out that everything that they said about the name Yahweh was true. All the references, you know, cited Encyclopedia Judaica and Oxford Dictionary, Webster's, and you name it, um, all those various references all refer to the original name of the Creator as being Yahweh given to Moses at that burning bush. But I was never taught that. I was never taught that in my Catholic upbringing, my Lutheran upbringing or my when I was finally confirmed as a Methodist upbringing either. So I never heard it in any any one of those places. 
And, uh, but then, you know, they come to find out that, you know, we, you know, as a Christian, you think that God's name is important, but as soon as you tell somebody that his name wasn't Jesus and all of a sudden they get defensive <laughs> or, you know, that the true name wasn't the Lord, it was Yahweh, <clears throat> they get defensive. And then all of a sudden it doesn't matter what you call him. But we find out here that Yahweh does care deeply about his name. He gave is the commandment about his name, don't take my name in vain, which means to make something useless or worthless. And I was taught something different than that. And Yahweh also said, my name shall continue as long as the sun, in Psalm 72, 17. And the sun is still shining in the sky. We all breathe the name Yahweh. You breathe in, and you breathe out. You've been breathing that name. And Adam, he breathed into Adam. And he became a living soul. And Adam was breathing his entire life. I was never taught these things. <clears throat> I was never taught that Yahshua was witnessed by law and prophets. I was taught that Jesus, you want to know something about Jesus? You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You read the New Testament because they call it the four Gospels. But really, it's not Gospels. Plural, it's gospel singular. Um, that, you know, they thought that if you want to learn something about Jesus, you got to go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those uh, those men will be testifying of, you know, of what Jesus was all about. Now, that's not the way we we're taught down here. We're taught that everything Yahshua said, everything Yahshua does, you know, what time he did it, what age he did it, and what manner he did it, was all fulfilling what was already written about him back in the Old Testament or the law, meaning your first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and from books of Joshua to Malachi. All those things were referencing things uh, about Yahshua and when he did something, why he did something, for what reason he did something, all those things were answered. And I was never taught anything like that in my religious upbringing and not to mention the covenants you know uh, we all thought we were trying to keep that old mosaic covenant you know i didn't even know it was a mosaic covenant when i was a christian i just thought we had to keep the ten commandments well the ten commandments were never given to a gentile they were given to the hebrews back there at mount sinai then ten commandment laws were given to israel and israel only uh, the nation of the, um, they were Hebrews because they were all descendants of Abraham or, you know, really, really descendants of Eber would be the origin of the Hebrews. And Abraham was a Hebrew. And then, you know, of course, after Abraham, Isaac, and then you had Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and the entire nation. Jacob had 12 sons and those sons were the tribes of Israel. And they were the ones that were given the Ten Commandment laws, plus, you know, another 603 ordinances. Those things were never given to a Gentile. They were given to the Jews or the Israelites and the Israelites only. Now, I didn't know that. So here I am trying to keep something that was never really given to me, nor was I taught correctly and things like that. I didn't know that I was in peril. I didn't know that I didn't know. I really thought I knew something. I had I had faith, I believed, but I really never challenged my belief. I um, was never taught to challenge. You know, you question your doctors, you challenge them about something that's wrong with you when it comes to your preacher, priester, or whoever's teaching you in your upbringing, you feel you don't want to ask questions because then they'll think you're a doubting Thomas or something like that. This is, these are the kinds of things that I was uh, influenced in my upbringing. And I'm very, very happy and glad that Yahshua has brought me to this teaching because this teaching has changed my life. It's totally, totally revolutionized the way I think about the creator of the universe. Now, this particular scripture is talking about a valley of dry bones. And we can start reading at one. And I might interrupt, not to be rude. It's just 
just trying to make a point. And sometimes there's a little lag in time between uh, the reader and, you know, the pauses. And, you know, it might seem like, uh, but, you know, I'm just trying to make a point if I do that, not to be rude. So I'm just telling you up front. But go ahead and start reading at one. The scripture reading Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. The hand of Yahweh was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of Yahweh and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. So he's having a vision, and the vision is basically he knows where the vision is coming from, and he's set in a valley. Now, a valley is a low point. You know, if you're in a valley, that means on one side there's hills or mountains. On the other side, there's hills and mountains. And you're in a valley, which would be a low, low point, not an elevated point. But in this valley was full of bones. Now, he didn't understand, you know, yet what was going on. But go ahead and read. And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. and lo. They were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? So here he's in a valley full of bones. Now, if you were thinking about that as a natural standpoint, you've seen a bunch of bones laying there. Would you think these bones could live? Mm. No, you think they're bones. They're dead. They've been gone a long time ago. They're dry. There's no, there's no flesh on them. They're just bones laying there. You know, people that dig these things up and put them in museums, you know, and you know, here's a valley full of bones, and, you know, there's many of them. You know, can these bones live is now the question. And, you know, and, and go ahead and read. And I answered, O Yahweh Elohim, thou knowest. Mm -hmm. Again, he, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. Now here... He's being told to prophesy onto these bones. Now, the word prophesy is to teach, right? to speak onto him, to teach these bones. Now, if you think from a natural standpoint, you're not just going to stand in a valley with a bunch of bones laying there and say, hey, bones, you know, can you hear me? <laughs> you, don't, you don't do that. This is, this is a, a, a vision he's having, an allegory of things. And these bones represent something. These bones represent the souls of mankind or Israelites, actually, at this time. Mm -hmm. They're dry. <clears throat> they're dead. And they're in a valley. They're at a very, very low point. And he tells them to prophesy on these bones. Why would he have to prophesy on these bones? Because prophecy is going to have an effect on these bones which represent a, a man's soul or the inner man. Mm -hmm. When you die um, and the flesh goes away, your bones remain. It, it's a type of, of, of the soul. I'm not saying your bones are your soul, so don't think that we're going to run around looking like a bunch of skeletons. Some people take things very literally. But it's an allegory about the inner man being dry and being dead, and many of them in that condition. And now he's prophesying to these bones. And go ahead and read. Verse 5, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. You know, he's going to cause breath to enter into these bones. Now, again, it's a principle because if they're just bones, there's no lungs to hold air, you know. But the thing is, he's going to cause breath. Breath represents spirit enter into these things. Go ahead and read. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you mm -hmm. and co cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. And you shall know that I am Yahweh. So in other words, Yahweh is creating all the conditions or the changes in the process of these bones having sinews laid upon them. The bones had nothing to do with the sinews. The bones had nothing to do with the flesh being laid on. This is all something that is being caused by the creator. He's going to lay sinews on them. He's going to cause the flesh to come on these bones. This teaching is going to build 
a foundation. This prophesying is going to build a, a, a structure of information, uh, understanding about what the creator is. And this teaching is going to start building those things. Read. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone. Mm -hmm. And when I beheld though the sinews and the flesh came upon, came up upon them and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. There was still no breath in them and breath would represent the spirit. So in other words, these bones or these souls or these men were being prophesied to and they were getting information, but still no breath was in them. There was no, uh, um, the spirit, what I, when I say spirit, what I really mean is the Holy Spirit was not in them yet. And the Holy Spirit's what's causing them to truly now be alive. But go ahead and read. Verse nine, then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they mm -hmm. may live. Right. Breathe. So I, I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army mm -hmm. so in other words through the prophecy you know a continuation of the prophecy at first there was the sinews then it was the flesh and eventually breath entered into them and these bones became alive mm -hmm. and they became read exceedingly great army verse 11 then he said unto me son of man these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Okay. Now that's good enough there. Now we just read a story about the Valley of Dry Bones and I gave you some spiritual principles about what that's representing. Now I'm going to go into the book and back some of this stuff up. Now, first of all, um, they're dry bones. So how do we know mankind or man's souls are are dry? Well, let's go to Amos 8 and 11 and Psalms 42 and 2. And we go to Psalm 63 and 1. We'll get those three. Amos 8 and 11. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh Elohim, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Yahweh. See, now the famine here is being correlated not of bread and not of water. Now, obviously, these bones were dead and these bones were dry. So obviously, they're <laughs> lacking water. But the famine, he's showing forth that this famine in the land is not of of the bread or the water but it's of hearing of the words of Yahweh and that's what we all had in Christianity we were hearing not the words of Yahweh we were hearing Christian concepts opinions imaginations of men misinterpolations misinterpretations uh, errors all over the place we weren't even calling them his name we were dry. We were we were in a famine because we never really truly heard the words of Yahweh. The words of Yahweh are preached by the law and prophets. And that's the true prophesying. The prophesying we had in the world wasn't, it was the famine. We, we weren't hearing the words of Yahweh. And it's a famine in the land. Now give me the next one I called for Psalms 42 and 2. Go ahead. Psalms 42 and 2. Oh, send out, for thou art the Elohim of my strength. Well, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong one. 
uh, my soul thirsteth for Yahweh, for the living Elohim. When shall I come and appear before Yahweh? Now, did you know your soul could be thirsty? Well, if your soul is thirsty, wouldn't that make your soul dry? It's the same principle. These bones are the, representing the inner man of, of the children of Israel, really mankind. And these bones are in a famine. Mankind's in a famine if you're in the words of Yahweh. These souls in the world are dry. Their souls are thirsty because they've never, ever been given the real water of the gospel. Now give me Psalms 63 and 1. Mm -hmm. 63 and 1. Oh, Yahweh, thy art my Elohim. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where See, no is water is. This dry and thirsty land. Isn't that the same type and shadow of the Valley of Dry Bones? Mm -hmm. Now, so, so the thing is, if we're thirsty, what can you do to a soul that's thirsty? You have to give it something to drink. You have to give it some water, some real water. Let's get Isaiah 55 and 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. And mm -hmm. he that hath no money, come, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Mm -hmm. Why do you So here it's money? talking about everyone that's thirsty, come to the waters and drink. Well, where's the water? I mean, where's it coming from? You know, we didn't know. We thought water's coming from a faucet, you know, or coming from a tap or from a river or from a creek or a lake. But the thing is, we're talking about spiritual water here. We're not talking about physical water. We're talking about the water that will quench your soul. Everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters and drink. Now, how do I know that we're talking about spiritual water? Let's get John 7 and 38. 7, 38. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now look at this. When I was in Christianity, he who believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. See, I thought the scriptures was Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. But that is not the scriptures that John 7, 38 is talking about. Why do I know that? Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't written yet. So that means when he's saying, he who believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You know, that is the water that will quench your soul. That is the teaching, the prophesying that you need to cause those thirsty, dry souls or bones to be quenched. Um, um, so. Now let's get, um, oh boy. Um, you know, we get to John the fourth chapter. Let's get John the fourth chapter where Yahshua is coming up to the Samaritan woman. And he talks to the Samaritan woman about water. Okay, maybe starting at nine. Yeah, that would be good. You can start there. Okay, John 4, 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, who am a woman of Samaria? Mm -hmm. for, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Right. Yahshua answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of Yahweh, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now here, Yash was talking about living water. Well, where did we hear about living water? We heard about in John 7, 30. He who believeth on me out of his script, out of his belly will flow rivers of what? Living water. So here's Yahshua talking about living water. Now we also know that living water is a representation of believing in Yahshua according to the law and prophets, not according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But go ahead and read. Uh, the woman saith unto him, Master, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From where mm -hmm. then hast thou that living water? It's a good question. And where is this living water going to come from? She's looking at it physically, naturally, academically. She's not looking at it the way Yash was looking at it spiritually. Read. 
Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave mm -hmm. us the well and drank from it himself and his sons right. and his cattle? Mm -hmm. Yahshua answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. So but if you drink of the natural water that's in that physical well that she's drawing from, you're going to be thirsty again. Read. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Now the but water the Yahshua can give you, you'll never thirst. But he's not talking about the water in that physical well. He's talking about a, wa a different water, a living water. Keep reading. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It's going to be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And that's the water. Someone who truly believes on Yahshua, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers. It's in him. And Yahshua says the water he gives you, that's going to be in him. It's going to be a wellspring of life. It's going to cause the bones to not be dry. It's going to cause the souls that were thirsty to never thirst again. It's going to cause these souls to be wellsprings of life. In other words, their ability to be able to preach the gospel, according to law and prophets, could cause others to be quickened or made alive. Now, um, let's... Let's work with the, these bones were dead. Well, let's get uh, uh, um, hmm, um, Romans, I think, 5 and 12. We'll work some death in this a little bit. Because these bones were dead and they were dry. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Mm -hmm. So now we have death coming in by one man, and that man being talked about here is Adam in the garden. When Adam ate that fruit, he died instantaneously in his conscience or his soul, or his soul became dead. His soul became uh, not alive spiritually anymore, even though he was physically alive, breathing and everything like that, lived for 900 and some odd years, but spiritually he was dead in his conscience or his soul. Read. Or, un or until the law sin, pardon me? For until the ahead, law read. sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned at the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So here we have death reigning all the way from Adam all the way to Moses. So now Doc Kinley would work with Moses being interpreted the Mosaic dispensation, which ran all the way to Yahshua Messiah, because Yahshua Messiah is the one that came in that took away that death, that, uh, he, you know, he died for that sin that was back there with Adam. He He's nailed it to a cross. He, he fulfilled that. Uh, let's get... Um, uh, First Corinthians 15, 22 to 28, and then we'll go to First Corinthians 15, 54 to 57. And all I'm trying to do is bring in the death with the, the dryness. And I'm trying to show you that the answer to the valley of dry bones is the water. Well, now we have dead souls. Now we need the answer to being able to make these souls that are dead alive, too. So let's get those ones I called here. First, uh, First Corinthians 15, 22. Through 28. Uh, for as in Adam all die. In Adam even, all die. Read. Even so in Yahshua shall all be made alive. So in Yahshua all be made alive. So again, it's the preaching of Yahshua that's in him a wellspring of life. He who believeth on me out of the script, as the scriptures, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That preaching is coming through Yahshua. Read. But every man in his own order. Yahshua, the first fruits, afterward, they that are the Messiahs at his coming. Mm -hmm. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to Yahweh, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all mm -hmm. power. 
for right. he must reign for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet the the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death mm -hmm. Yahshua is going to destroy that death that reigned from Adam all the way through the Mosaic covenant or the Mosaic dispensation read for he that put all things under his feet but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted who did put all things under him. And when all, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject, subject unto him that put all things under him, mm -hmm. that Yahweh may be all in all. That Yahweh may be all in all, read. And then jump down. Now let's drop down to... Uh... Well, the next one I called for um, 54. Okay, 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall he brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O now grave, that death that had sting that reigned from Adam all the way through the Mosaic com covenant and these mortals, mortal means to die. Immortal means that you don't die. So when you become a recipient of the Holy Spirit, you know, and that's at Pentecost, once the Holy Spirit's in you, that caused these, the, you become immortal because the Holy Spirit is going to go on in the ages to come. That is our, our ticket to the next age or to go on is to have that Holy Spirit in us. That's the immortality that is swallowing up the death. Uh, um, that is a quickening spirit. That's a quickened spirit, you know, because Yahshua is the quickening spirit, and that soul has been quickened or made alive. That's the word quickened means to make alive. Go ahead and read. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Mm -hmm. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to Yahweh who giveth well, now watch us. watch this. But thanks be to Yahweh, read. Who giveth us the victory through our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. He gives us the victory through our Savior, Yahshua Messiah. So it's through Yahshua that we have the victory of overcoming that death that was reigning in mankind all the way down to Yahshua Messiah. So, you know, that death was, was something that was a uh, uh, ruling. Now, so these valley of dry bones, they were dead. They were um, dry. And Yahshua is the answer for quickening them through the preaching of the gospel to make them alive with the water or to uh, uh, a quicken, to, to make you alive and uh, spiritually, you know, because our souls were mortal, meaning to die. Now, let's get... Uh, uh, Proverbs um, 17 and 22. Proverbs 17, 22. A, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Now, before we came to class, we were all of a broken spirit. You know, our we didn't have we didn't have the Holy Spirit in us. We were lacking. We were found in, we were, were found wanting. We we were missing something. We were empty. We needed to have something put in us to make us become no longer dry. We had to have something put in us to make us no longer dead. We had to be uh, uh, made alive. Now, now back there at the time of uh, 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 Adam in the garden, he was told to be fruitful and multiply and when we read genesis 2 and 18 let's get genesis 2 and 18 genesis 2 and 18 and yahweh elohim said it is not good that the man should be alone it's not good I that a man should be alone it's talking about adam in the garden and now, Adam in the garden is a repeat of what's really trying to represent Yahshua. Yahshua is not going to be alone, but go ahead and read. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Mm -hmm. 
And out of the ground, Yahweh Elohim formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. So and here's whatsoever... Yahweh took all the animals and paraded them, you know, in front of Adam to see if any of those animals would be a help meet or meet means to make suitable or fit for the man. Uh, uh, and none were that way. Go ahead, read. Um, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Mm -hmm. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, mm -hmm. there was not found a helpmeet for him. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which Yahweh Elohim hath taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Mm -hmm. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And, and Eve, that was made from his very own rib, became one with him. In other words, this woman was bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, because it was it came from the man. And this woman became the true help meat or what was suitable for Adam to have as, as, a, as a meat. Now, it's the same thing with us. Now, when you look at uh, 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 Yash and Messiah, he's the husband and we're the bride. Now, let's go to Ephesians 5 and 30. We're working with the bone principles because we were working with water. We were working with death. Now we're working a little bit with the bones. Go ahead. Well, we are members of his body. Now it's talking his... about we are members of whose body? Yash. We're members of Yahshua's body. He's the husband and we're the bride. He's the head. We're the body. And we, we collectively, souls, in this teaching, are members of his body, read. Of his flesh and uh -huh. of his bones. And of his bones. Now remember the valley of dry bones. We didn't start out. We were dry. We were dead. We needed to be quickened and made alive to become true members of his body and of Yahshua's bones. Or our inner man's become connected with uh, with Yahshua, our souls are knit with him. We're members of his body. We're members of his bones. And now let's get Psalms 34 and 20. I don't know if there's any more there or not, but we can drop the uh, uh, Psalms 34 and 20. It quotes uh, uh, what you just read. It said, 31 says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two mm -hmm. shall be one flesh so it's the same principle going back right. there with adam and eve that she was a member of his body and his bones and we're the same way with yashua we're coming from yashua he's the reason that we had sinews laid upon us he's the reason we had flesh laid upon us he's the reason that these bones lived and became alive and became an army of of israel the true israelites you know back there they were just a uh, type and a shadow of it. Now, uh, mm -hmm. did I call Psalms 34 and, uh, and 20? Yes. He keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Mm -hmm. Now that's talking about Yahshua keeps all his bones. Not one of his bones are broken or lost. So in other words, Yahshua has a body that has been foreordained. And it's a specially prepared body. And none of those bones, None of his souls or none of the members of his body will be lost. None of them. He keeps them all. Read. Evil is uh, evil oh, is shall it, did, did evil I, shall I, slay I, the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. Okay, we already read that part. It keepeth all the bones, none of this is broken. Okay. Yes. Now let's go to Colossians because uh, um, we're talking about Eve was made as a help meet in those animals back there. None of them were meat for him. Let's go to Colossians 1 and 12. We'll bring this scripture in because now that Yahshua was making us members of his body or his bones through the foolishness of preaching, he's causing our souls to be made alive. 
that were dead and that were dry. Um, now, let's just see Colossians 1 and 12. Given thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the sons in light. And that we're giving thanks to Yahweh that he has made us meet. He's made us meet or suitable or to be fit to be partakers of this beautiful heavenly calling. You know, um, so the thing is, you know, so our bones were being made meat. We're being made suitable. We're be members of his body and the condition of the bones and the condition after of our souls and our bones are now changing. You know, in this valley of dry bones is an allegory of the spiritual reality of what's happening to us when we uh, come to this teaching. Now, let's go to um, um, Hebrews 4 and 12, because we talked about uh, and another thing in the scripture reading, it talks about that he caused breath to enter into these bones, right? So in John 20 and 22, let's get John 20, 22, because Yahshua fulfilled that with this particular scripture right here. Uh, and then we'll go to Ephesians 2 and 1. That's John 20 and 22. Correct. Now here's and Yahshua with his disciples. And, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that what happened with the Valley of Dry Bones? Didn't he cause breath to enter into them? Mm -hmm. Wasn't it Yahweh that caused the breath to enter into this valley? So here now, Yash was breathing on them. And read. Whosoever sin ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sin ye retain, they are retained. Mm-hmm. But so Thomas, talk, oh, keep going. The, no, I, I think that's probably cut enough. Okay. Now let's go to Ephesians. Uh, let's go to Hebrews 4 and 12. Oh, I don't know how much time I have. I wasn't really sure what kind of a time frame I had. So um, Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, mm -hmm. piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thought and intents of the heart. Now here we're talking about the word of Yahweh being sharper than any two-edged sword. Now we talk about also in Ephesians over there where it talks about put on the whole armor of Yahweh. It talks about the breastplate of righteousness and and uh, and uh, you know the loins girt with truth and the uh, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and then above all take on the you know on the sword the helmet of salvation and the, and the sword you know the powers in the sword and Yahweh the word of Yahweh is the sword and it's and it's quick the word quick means to make alive it means to make something alive when you quicken something you make something that was dead alive. So in other words, to quicken, the word of Yahweh is quick and more powerful than any two-edged sword. So in other words, Yahshua's words, that teaching by the law and prophets, that wellspring of life, them he that believes on him as the scripture, that is a powerful two-edged law prophet sword able to make someone alive. And it's also able to what? Read. It's quick and sharper than any two-edged sword. Two -edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. See, that words are piercing to the souls of man. Mm -hmm. And that's what the preaching of the gospel is doing. It's piercing these dry bones in the valley. It's causing those bones to be quickened or made alive. Piercing down right into the very core of a man who was dead and, and changing the conditions of that man. Uh, go ahead and read. And of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And he's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, when we go to Ephesians 2 and 1, let's go to Ephesians 2 and 1. Mm-hmm. 
Now I'm just using various principles in this Valley of Dry Bones because there's so many different aspects you can work with with this valley, whether it's the bones or the dead state or the water state or, you know, and all this kind of stuff. We can, believe me, get more scriptures too. I see the five minutes. Thank you. Uh, 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 but go ahead and read what I called for. Ephesians 2.1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and now, sin. Now, didn't we just get done showing you how that valley was dead? Mm -hmm. That valley was dry. And now it's saying, Yah, here it's saying in you hath he quickened. Now, Yahshua resurrected a quickening spirit. And what he's doing is he's quickening souls with the Holy Spirit. And his words, his teaching by the law and prophets is sharp. They are able to do a job. They're able to heal. They are able to cause the blind to see. They are able to cause the deaf to hear. They are able to make someone who is weak to be strong. They are they're able. The words of Yahweh are quick, they're sharp, and they're more powerful. It takes power to raise somebody from the dead. It takes Yahshua raised Lazarus from the tomb who was dead for four days. Lazarus come forth. Those words are sharp. Those words are powerful and he did that to demonstrate that he's the resurrection of life and he could through his preaching and teaching cause souls to be quickened souls to be made alive to become members of his body members of his bones and none of his bones are broken none of his bones are lost if you get the holy spirit that is a forever sealed deal. And there's no better place to be than to be that way. You have to be quickened. Who were once dead. We were all once dead. We were all raised in the nonsense and the corruption in the world. You know, and it's through the foolishness of preaching that he's allowed us to come up out of that. I mean, I, I was just watching TV and closing. We could say a lot more about these things, but... In closing, where I was watching TV the other day, and at all these, the Railroad Museum in Green Bay has this huge Christmas tree display. And they got Christmas trees that are gold, and Christmas trees that are green and blue, and all the different colors. And, you know, and there's just numerous trees, and they have a Christmas tree displayed by uh, various organizations and stuff like that. And, and they had one tree put up. It was for uh, the gay rights and transgenders. It was a rainbow, basically, tree. It's for the tra transgenders and the gay rights. And then they had another tree that was for the satanic, uh, I think it was the satanic kingdom or the kingdom of Satan or something like that. It was a, a, a Christmas tree dedicated to Satan worshipers. And it was at the railroad museum. And on the news, the, the priest they interviewed a priest and a priest was just totally appalled that they would put up a Christmas tree to Satan, you know, and they wanted that tree removed from the railroad museum because they thought all those other trees were representing uh, the birth of their Lord and savior, Jesus. And, you know, and they wanted that Satan tree to be uh, uh, ripped down, but the railroad museum wouldn't do that because they felt everyone had the right to represent the trees. They would, Here's the thing is the priest was sitting there and yelling about complaining about that Satan tree. Every one of those trees, the gold ones, the blue ones, the silver ones, all those trees are nothing but paganism. They're all wrong. They're all, they're all an error. But the mystery of iniquity is just nitpicking at themselves or each other. They don't know what the truth is. Those, all those trees are coming out of paganism. And it just blows my mind how blessed we truly are to come in contact with this teaching that Yahshua has pulled us out of that state of dryness, that state of death, and has quickened us and made us alive by the power of his sword or words and made us an army like that was an army of Israel and put on the whole armor of Yahweh. We put on the whole armor and we stand strong in Yahshua. If Yahshua be for you, who can be against you? And I know the world's rough. It's a tough place. But if you got Yahshua on your side, just trust him. Hang on to him. 
And I hope somebody got something out of it. It's truly a great honor and privilege to say anything about Yahshua at all, because if it wasn't for him, I'd know nothing. And peace and love to the brethren. I thanks for the opportunity. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Verkaterin. And our next speaker this afternoon will be the Dean of our Oceanside, California class, Dr. Dennis Volpe. I want to say good evening to everyone. I'm trusting that everybody can hear me okay. We yes, can. we can. All right, great. Now, I picked that scripture for a very important reason tonight. And I also picked our first speaker, because I knew that he would set that whole thing up. Now, I want you to know that this is possibly the center core of what this teaching is really all about and what the purpose of Yahweh is getting accomplished with both the angelic and physical creation. Now, one thing we have to understand is this, that Yahweh is spirit. And spirit is something that is abstract and incomprehensible to our carnal or finite mind to comprehend. In order for Yahweh to get across this spiritual knowledge of him through this purpose, he had to set the whole thing up. And I want to go to, if you would get me, please, Greg, can you run over there and get me the uh, 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 ages and dispensation chart, please? Thank you. Now, what I want you to know is the whole purpose boils down to this, that Yahweh is salvation. And what we have here, this ages chart, this is the seven ages of Yahweh's purpose of salvation. And what he does for the first three ages, both the first, second, and third age, he is setting up what we'll call manifestations of principles that will be revealed in the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth age. Now, what I want you to see is this, that everything that we know about Yahweh has to be demonstrated by something that is tangible to us, comprehensible to us, something we can see. And we have to be able to use one of our main tools in this teaching when you come in here is we go to Romans uh, 1, 19 and 20, and I'm not going to have it read because I don't want to dwell on that too long, that the natural or physical things are causing us to understand spiritual things or invisible things. So, what we've got, we have to start this whole purpose out uh, there in the first stage there with Adam in the earth plane uh, undergoing a death. We know that Yahweh set up that he could eat of every tree in the Garden of Eden with the exception of one. Now, what he gave him, he told them that he could not touch or eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which was set in the midst of the garden. Dr. Kinley once said that that tree was no, no more special than the tree to the right of it or to the left of it. He simply picked a tree in the middle of the garden so that Adam and Eve would pass that tree every day in their uh, traveling in the garden. And so that tree became center to them. Once you tell somebody you can't have something and then put it on the table right in front of them, they can't help but think about it, wonder about it, and all these things. And Yahweh is setting the stage for the mystery of iniquity to come in and cause uh, deception to take place, to cause Adam and Eve to partake of that tree now, we know that Adam wasn't deceived. The woman was deceived. Adam willingly partook of the fruit to show forth that he loved his bride and he was willing to die for her. Now, what happens is that death that took place was not necessarily, uh, well, I should say this. Dr. Kinley used to talk about how in Genesis, uh, Yahweh said, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Now, we find out when we read in Genesis that Adam lived for 930 years. 
And people, you know, would say, well, gee, that's quite a long time to live. Uh, what about the fact that you're supposed to die in the day that you eat it? And Dr. Kinley, you said, put it like this. He said, now the death that took place of the physical body was nothing more than a demonstration of what had transpired spiritually within Adam's soul. That when he ate that fruit, he received condemnation. Now, condemnation means to die. He died within his soul with that state of condemnation because of disobedience. And that, uh, if you will, that uh, uh, pronouncement of death was then imputed and placed upon all mankind from Adam all the way down to Yahshua the Messiah. Everybody that was born was uh, automatically uh, charged with the, uh, if you will, that transgression that took place by Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, we've got the whole creation now from Adam down to the Messiah in a death state. Now, the death state that Yahweh is concerned with, Yahweh's not concerned about the physical body dying. He's concerned about what is everlasting dying, and that is the soul, which uh, Andy got up here and did a beautiful job trying to express to you. That soul is not something, your soul is not something physical. It is a product of spirit, and your soul is a spiritual uh, nature or entity within this physical body represented by the bone structure in the in the human body. The bone structure or the skeleton is nothing more than a man within a man. Your outer flesh and covering, uh, and if you've ever thought about this, everything on the outside of your body, your skin, your hair, your nails, is dead material. So all of the outside of you is actually in a state of death, and your soul is inside that body dwelling within something that is dead on the outside. Now, Yahweh set that manifestation up to get across something, that our souls were in a perpetual state of condemnation and death from Adam down to the Messiah. And what we find out, too, is that uh, Paul talks about how we are by nature the children of wrath. It's just that, and, and the children of Israel, I have to say this, in the third age when Yahweh brings in, uh, in the post-Diluvian age, the law, and that was talked about tonight too, the law was called the law of sin and death. And it's referred that way by uh, over there in the writings of Paul. Now, that's because that law was contrary to the nature of the people. Everybody that is born is born with a carnal mind, or in other words, not spiritual. It's just physical, it doesn't have any conscious awareness, doesn't know a thing about Yahweh. So when we come into the world, we're carnal. And in Ro get, so, uh, one of my readers, go get Romans 8, 6, please. Romans 8 and 6. For to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, we don't even realize that when we walk in the door that we're carnally minded. I never thought of myself before I came as class. Jeez, you know, I'm a carnal mind. <laughs> you know, I didn't even know what that meant until I came down here. The truth of the matter is that it simply means not spiritual. Now, in, in John, uh, when Yahshua was speaking to the woman at the well, and he talked to her about giving her living water. Further down, he said that Yahweh, the time has come when the true worshipers are going to worship Yahweh in spirit and in truth. Now, back there under the Mosaic Covenant, they did not worship Yahweh in spirit and in truth. They worshiped him in ceremonies, holidays, uh, uh, carnal ordinances that they were given, uh, feast days, all of this stuff was natural and physical. None of it was really spiritual. Now, those things were set up all the way down through in the natural sense to illustrate or to be an example or a, what we call a type in a shadow, later to be understood, of something that is spiritual. But we need the physical to understand the spiritual. So I, I guess I'm going to have that read anyway because i got plenty of time. Get me Romans 1, 19 and 20 as well. Romans 1, 
Romans 1 19 because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them for Yahweh hath shown it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead now so watch. that they are without excuse. without excuse now what I want you to see is whatever can be known about Yahweh has to be manifested Manifestation is a, an example of something that you're trying to get across that has no physical property, properties. Now, let me use an example. Uh, uh, mathematics. When you learn simple addition, you learn how to count and sub add and subtract, they will use something to illustrate that. They'll put an apple on the table. They say, here we have one apple. This is one. Now we put another one on the table. Now we have two apples. Now what we see is that one plus one equals two. Now mathematics is an abstract conceptualization. And when we use the, the, a manifestation with the apples, somebody can get that and understand it. And that's how you're taught. You're taught by examples that will illustrate a principle, in this case, the mathematical principle. Now, in the same respect, Yahweh is spirit, and you can't see spirit, you can't touch it, you have no uh, physical uh, ability to perceive it, to comprehend it, nothing. So therefore, Yahweh, who desired to make himself known to creatures that he would bring forth in his purpose, had to devise a way to illustrate or to manifest himself in order for you to know what spirit is. So what he did in the first three ages, all these things you read down through what you call the Old Testament with Adam in the garden, eating the fruit, uh, the flood with Noah, uh, the Israelites here uh, coming up out of Egypt. I mean, it goes on and on, right down through the books of the prophets. Uh, uh, David uh, fighting with a big giant. Uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego being put in a fiery furnace. Uh, Daniel fed to the lions. All of this stuff was manifestational things that you can see, you can comprehend, that later you'll find out that it represents a spiritual principle of how Yahweh actually is and truthfully exists and what his purpose is. But he must set it up first. And during the setup phase, which was from uh, right down from the first age, right down through to the time of the, th the opening of the fourth age, all of those things, none of it Yahweh revealed to any man, yet the spiritual reality of any of those things that he did back there in your Old Testament. In fact, Peter talks about how that even when the prophets would be inspired to write, to prophesy, they searched those things trying to comprehend and understand the meaning of those things and were not able to because it was not given to them then to know. It was uh, given for them to set that up for us after uh, the opening of the fourth age to be revealed to us and then them in, a, in another aspect, Yahweh is going back to reveal those things to them as well, which we'll probably talk about tonight. But what I want you to see is that everything first has to be set up and, and manifested. Later, Yahshua is going to open up the understanding of what all those things were for and why they point to knowing your Creator and worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Now, first thing I want to do just to show you that what I'm saying to you is founded, because uh, I know not everybody here has as much foundation as some of us old timers. So what I want to do is I want to go back over, let's go over to the book of John, the fifth chapter. I want mm -hmm. you to start at verse 25. Okay. 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of Yahweh, and they that hear shall live. Now watch. Watch. That's got to be manifested. So here's what happens. And, 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 you know, it's in the prophets too. But I want to show you an example right there at the time when the Messiah was born, by the way. Let me straighten this out right now. That was not the beginning of the New Testament. 
Now, we think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the New Testament. What you don't realize that when Yahshua was born, he was born as a Hebrew or a Jew, still under the Mosaic Covenant from Mount Sinai, doing the things that were set up back there at the time of Moses. That's what Yahshua had to go do. He had to, you know, he had to have a Passover supper, for an example. Even baptism was part of the Old Covenant. And he had to be baptized by John the Baptist. All these things uh, are him doing what was set up back from Moses. It wasn't that he was setting up something new. This stuff was already in effect. Now, what I want you to see is this, that Yahshua came in to fulfill or to end the covenant with Moses, to usher in what was prophesied in the book of Jeremiah, also in Ezekiel, uh, that there would be a new covenant that would come in effect. Now, the new covenant can't come in effect until the old covenant is already finished and completed. Now, subsequent, so what we find out is that Yahshua says over there in Matthew 5, he says that I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill or to complete it, to finish it. And he says that over and over again. And many of his, uh, never once did he say he came to set up something or start something. And that's because he already set it up in the first three ages. Now he's coming to finish it, to usher in a new covenant. Now, the first covenant was all natural physical ordinances and forms of worship. The new covenant is going to be a worshiping in spirit and in truth, which is what he told the woman at the well. Uh, go, somebody go get that. Get John uh, 4.23 and 24, if you don't mind. I got it. John 4. <clears throat> 23, but the hour cometh that now is when the true worship, worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now listen, that, the, that, that implication of the true worshipers, uh, the time will come, it isn't here yet, he said, it will come when the true worshipers shall worship. Well, what do you mean, the true worshipers? What, are they, what were they doing back there from Moses on down? Well, in other right. words, none of that worship was spirit. It was not spiritual at all. It was carnal. In It was physical. Now, Yahweh right. wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, not in physical things. He set those things up to point to something spiritual for us to learn. And he also mm -hmm. intended, to, at a given point, to end those physical forms of worship. Now, our founder used to say this, what is valid in one age and dispensation is not necessarily valid in the next. Now, here's what I want you to see. Yahshua made the statement that I am the resurrection of life. And what I want you to know is this, Yahshua has to fulfill things that are already written back in the scriptures. Now, one thing that we find out is that he said, the time will come when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of Man or the Son of Yahweh and live. Now, watch. Lazarus, who was the brother, I believe, of Martha and Mary, if I'm not mistaken. Anyhow, Lazarus fell sick. And, they, and he was not there in the area, so they went to him where he was and said, look, Lazarus is sick, we need you to come. And Yahshua said, oh, you know, I'll, uh, he'll be fine. And he delayed his coming for four days. Hmm. And then they came to him now basically to tell him that Lazarus had died because he said that Lazarus was sleeping. And the people didn't understand when Yashua said that. They thought he actually thought he was actually sleeping like when you go to bed at night. And Yashua finally came out plainly and said, Lazarus is dead. Now he left him dead and they buried him in that tomb. He was there for four days before he got back there. Now when he came back, he said that he thanked Yahweh for this happening so that, so that they would believe that he was the resurrection of life. In other words, he set it up for Lazarus to die and for him then to come four days later. 
Not like they, they, you know, he was there and he gave him CPR and all of a sudden his heart started again and everybody go, oh, go, oh, the CPR saved him. Look, he let him lay in the tomb dead for four days. Now here's why. Because when Adam ate that fruit, you're going to find out that it was, it was from the point when they left that garden of 4,000 years had passed till the Messiah comes in and is born. Now, Peter says that one day with Yahweh is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So therefore, he had waited after mankind was pronounced dead. In other words, they were dead in their souls and they left them dead and I might say rotting in their sins for four days or 4,000 years. So in the fulfillment, when he comes in, he has to have the man die that he loved, by the way, because Yahweh loved many of these uh, so-called, what we call the patriarchs down through the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, uh, Noah. He loved them all, but he had to let them die in their sins and wait four days or 4,000 years for him to come in to resurrect them. So Yahshua waits four days, then he goes down to the tomb where they had buried Lazarus. And here's what he did. He said, come forth. No, that's not right. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because if he just shouted out over there in the cemetery, come forth, all of those graves would open up and those bodies would come forth out of those tombs. But he called by name the one that he was raising. He wasn't raising everyone. He was raising those that he loved. Therefore, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And they rolled that stone away. Well, he told them to roll it away before he called him. Lazarus heard the voice of Yahshua. And you say, well, what do you mean he was dead? I'm telling you, his soul heard that voice. It was put back in that body, and that body then was able. And don't forget, they even told him that he was already starting to decay. In other words, Yahweh is, uh, Yahshua is capable of causing new flesh to come upon them. And he raises Lazarus from the dead on the fourth day that they might believe that he's the resurrection of life. Now that was an example. It was just a type and a shadow. It was not the reality of the resurrection. Now Dr. Kinley used to say this, that they marveled when Yahshua raised Lazarus out of that tomb. They all thought, oh my goodness, did you? Did he has power to raise somebody from a dead state. And Yahshua even told them, he said, greater things than this will you do. And we would think, what's greater than going out there and raising your loved one from the state of death? Well, did you know that Lazarus had to die all over again and go back to the grave because it was only temporary? It was temporary, which means there's a greater resurrection that is eternal. That is, that these things are just a type and a shadow. They're pointing to something greater. So here he tells them that, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the dead shall hear his voice and live. Now, I want you to know that that is exactly how you are being raised from his, from the dead. You also come into class, as it were, dead. our founder used to say, dead on arrival. Now that means your body is working fine. I, I mean, I was quite young when I came into this class and my body was in great shape. So I wouldn't consider myself dead by our standards of death. But here's the point, my soul was dead. My soul had no spiritual understanding of Yahweh. I was carnally minded and I had condemnation because I had violated my conscience during the course of my life. Now, I was in a dead state. Now, when I came on down to this school and heard the Holy Spirit speaking through a vessel on the floor, and I, I, I want to make that point clear. I didn't even realize at that point what it meant that the Holy Spirit was in a person, but I'm telling you the words that came forth and the knowledge that was being professed, I knew. I just I, I had this this the uh, 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 realization that these things 
are the truth coming directly from the Creator. So it didn't matter what speaker was on the floor. I wasn't listening to, let's say, uh, I don't remember who it was the first person I spoke to or heard this speak, but I said it wasn't John's voice that I was hearing. I was hearing a voice from heaven. That is to say, knowing that that was the spirit of Yahweh speaking through that vessel and that these things that are being discussed or spoken are really directly from the creator himself. And I want you to realize that that caused something to change down inside me. Deep down inside, or that, that, that caused a change, a conscious realization that there is a God and he's real. And his name is Yahweh. And I then started feeling, the, uh, actually sensing uh, uh, the, the awe of re realizing that I am uh, uh, conscious that there's a creator. And once you have that awareness that there is a creator, that never leaves you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you. And so we are being raised from the dead right there on a chair, right there on a chair by the foolishness of preaching, just like what we read tonight in that scripture reading. And I want, I want to spend time to go into that scripture reading too, because I want you to know everything that was done until the day of Pentecost was a fulfillment of a manifestation and was not permanent yet. Uh, Lazarus was not permanently raised from the dead. And those souls that came up out of the grave when Yahshua uh, resurrected uh, and took on those, if you will, sinews and flesh, and I'll say it like this, they were ectoplasmatically materialized, is the way Dr. Kinley used to say it. That did not last either, or they'd be walking around still today. That was temporary. The permanent aspect of resurrection would not take place until the day of Pentecost on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That is when there was a change now of ages, where now we're entering into a spiritual age, and it's the age of grace. Now, uh, uh, going back to what we just read uh, there in John 5, 25, that they would hear the voice and live, read down a few more verses. Um, 5.25? Well, you read 5, uh, what was it? I can't, wait a minute, hang on for a minute. It's hard to read this. You read 5.25. Whoever was reading John 5.25 for me. 5.25. Barely I send you coming. Uh, I'll pick it up. Barely, barely I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of, of Yahweh and they... They that hear shall live. Keep reading. For, for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Go ahead. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Read. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice mm -hmm. and shall come forth that they have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. All right. Now, what I want you to recognize is this. He said that the time is coming in which the graves right. are all going to be open. Now, we have to have that manifested is what I'm trying to show you. So, that being said, I want to talk to you about, I want to go back over to the scripture reading again, because that scripture reading is a prophecy about the resurrection of the soul and the implementing then of an eternal covenant. And I want to talk about that, because if you have to read that whole chapter and piece together the part about the Valley of Dry Bones and then the gathering into one what he calls the sticks over there, which represent the divisions that had taken place with those uh, that he had made these promises to. And we'll talk about that. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have you uh, get too much out of the first part of the scripture because I'm gonna just briefly explain to you. Let me go back over to Ezekiel here in my book. Uh, hang on. 
Now, in the first part, he's set in the Valley of Dry Bones. We already know, it was it was told to you by the first speaker, and it's in the scripture reading, that it represents the souls of those that were in the house of Israel. And we know that those souls being dry, as it was already explained, they had no living water. They did not know their creator, how he actually is and truthfully exists. Because we read, the Messiah says in John 17 and 3, that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, and that uh, the Father and the Son, whom Yahweh has sent. And therefore, we know what eternal life is. Nobody had that yet. Nobody could have it until the preaching of the gospel after Pentecost. So what we find out is that everything that was done before that was temporary. It was not permanent yet. So what happened is there was two prophesying that took place. The first one caused the sinews in the flesh to form upon the bones. That means something was being put upon their soul. Now when the Messiah was with the apostles for his ministry of three and a half years, he was speaking many, many things, information, giving them information that they did not yet understand. But it was con it was put upon them. They knew that those things that he was saying, uh, they recognized that those things had to be obviously uh, uh, at some point brought to their understanding. And Yahshua told them, what I've told you in darkness, proclaim in light which means you're still in darkness to the reality of what I've said to you, but there'll come a time when you will be in the light and know what these things mean. And and, and I'll be in all things that I've said to you have been committed to your memory. He said in John 14, 26, that when the Comforter has come, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall bring back to your remembrance all things that I have said unto you. Now, those things is, are, are committed to them. That is them receiving, as Doc used to say, he had the vision, but he had not had the revelation yet. He saw it all, but he didn't know what to do with what was shown to him. And when Yahweh asked him, man, what will you do with what I've shown you? He couldn't answer. He knew what he saw. He knew what Yahweh showed him, but he didn't understand yet what that was all for ultimately and what to do with it. Now, what happened is he had to get the Holy Spirit in him, and that was the revelation. Once the Holy Spirit entered into him, it opened up to him what those things were all for, what they meant, so that he was now able to go out and preach the gospel of salvation to the world. And those that would receive it, those that would understand it, that would have it revealed to them, would receive eternal life. That's what was going on there. So here's what happens. The first prophesying would be analogous to you coming down and hearing the vision that Dr. Kinley had or the information that we give you down here. And the second prophesying is from the wind. Now the wind is a figure of the spirit, which means that that wind, which represents, and your breath is wind, that's what it is. And on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles were in that upper room, that's when they heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Now that is to show that the Holy Spirit now has come into them, and when it's come into them, it's now going to open up to them their understanding of what Yahshua was talking about when he was teaching them all these many things. So we sometimes have that same experience right in class. Our founder had that experience. He saw the vision. Three times he was asked, what will you do with what I've shown you? And he couldn't answer. But when Yahweh gave him that revelation, that is to say he put the Holy Spirit in him, now he knew exactly what to do. To go teach his people, to go teach your, he said to teach your people your will. Well, he couldn't do that without the Holy Spirit because he didn't really understand yet what Yahweh's will was until the Spirit mm -hmm. entered into him. Now, the, Yahshua has to do the same thing with his, with his apostles. He has to put upon them all that information and knowledge. Then when the wind comes, that's to say the Holy Spirit, that will take the, that the second prophesying that uh, uh, manifested in this story of Ezekiel, that's when their understanding was now opened up by way of revelation. And that revelation enabled them to do what? 
to stand in the gospel. Now, here's a good example of that. Peter, when he had heard all these things Joshua said and was with him and saw him do many miraculous things, the night that they took Joshua out, Peter went out there and they saw him and said, well, weren't you one of his disciples? He said, oh, I don't know the man. Three times he denied Joshua because he didn't yet have a revelation and he didn't have the strength of conviction in him yet. And he, he's still having fear. And, and therefore, uh, you know, he did those things. And we know what it says that he wept bitterly because he did it. But we know that Joshua told him that, uh, you know, that, Yash, that, the, the, that Lucifer desired to have him so that he might sift him as wheat, and that he might sift him as wheat. And he said... When thou art strengthened, he said, uh, uh, he said, then uh, uh, hold. He told him once he got, I'm trying to remember the exact wording, so I'm just going to tell you this. When he told him, when you get the Holy Spirit, essentially, then go out and, and strengthen your brethren. You know, yeah. preach the gospel. Converted, strengthen the brethren. How does it go again? When you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Now, what I want you to see is this, that that conversion process takes place only by revelation only. The revelation is what converts you from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded, to have yourself conscious of your creator. So here's why that's greater than what Yahshua did with Lazarus, because once you receive the Holy Spirit through the foolishness of preaching and you receive a revelation, you will never change. You will never go come off of that, in other words. You will not ever at any time again be ignorant of Yahweh or will you lose the Holy Spirit. Under the first uh, three ages, when the Holy Spirit was manifested in people setting up the purpose, it was only temporary. They all died devoid of the Holy Spirit and were waiting for a Redeemer. So here's what Yahshua does. When he's crucified and then he's put in that tomb, while he's in that tomb on the Sabbath day, he is going back to the captives that are in the grave. As it reads in your Bible, some Bibles say the captives in hell. Now, hell doesn't mean where the devil is with the fire and all that stuff. Hell is a term for the grave. And all that died from before Yahshua, every one of them were in a state of repose, waiting for redemption and to be brought into, as it were, the kingdom, which we now know is to be put in Yahshua. Yahshua said the kingdom is not meats and drinks, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Nobody was in the kingdom back there under the old covenant. The kingdom comes, so to speak, when I say that, I hope you understand this, the kingdom was actually prepared from the foundation of the world, but I want you to know from your vantage point, the kingdom comes to you, not with observation, but it's within you. Now, so when the Holy Spirit is poured out and that spirit enters into you, you are then translated into the kingdom of Yahshua. And that kingdom is everlasting. And it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he talks about this in the next part of this chapter of 37 Ezekiel. So I want to go back over there. Now, he told them to prophesy a second time, and we know the breath entered into them, right? So now I want to go to, let's see here. All right, I got to get down here. Well, he, he told them to prophesy unto the wind, okay? And then the breath would enter into them. So he did that. Okay. And then he talks about how the bones are the whole house of Israel, all right? And their bones are dried up and their hope is lost. We, uh, you know, and so he has to raise them from that state. And they have to stand. Now, what they're going to stand in, it's not a question. I mean, we see the manifestation of you getting up on your feet and standing. That's, that's a manifestation. But the reality is when you're able to be grounded in the gospel or the truth because of a revelation has put such conviction in you that you cannot be moved off of it. Nobody could take it away from you. You cannot walk away from it. You are grounded in it. Our founder once said, if you ever catch on to what I'm talking about, he said, you're going to die just that way, which means you'll, it'll never leave you and you won't leave it. All right, hang on. I want to get down here. 
All right, after he does this, let's go to verse uh, 13 for a minute. Ezekiel 37, 13. Yeah. And ye shall know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Now, the graves in this case are not the earth that you're going to be buried in if you should die. That's what we think of. We think that all these graves are going to open like on a Halloween show, and these people are going to come up out of the ground. The grave is you being dead in your sins and you being, uh, 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 your body is made from the dust of the earth and your inner man is dead and buried down inside this body. Now, your soul is going to be liberated from this physical state and this physical body to receive an immortal glorified body at the end of this age. And once you come into class, though, here's what's happening. You are literally being translated into the kingdom. And I'm talking about your soul, not your physical body. You are already in a state of everlasting life. And that's what's greater because, the, the like I told you, Lazarus had to go back to the grave. Those people that had rose from the, on the day of the resurrection to go into Jerusalem, they had to go right back to the state that they were in because the kingdom was opened on the day of Pentecost. Now, all right, so it says, Oh, my people that brought you out of your graves. We're walking around with our grave clothes. That's this physical body. This physical body is our grave clothes, and we're going to be brought out of this state of being fleshly and carnal in a body that is mortal. We have a mortal body, but our soul is alive forevermore. So at the close of this age, you're going to receive an immortal glorified body that goes with a soul that is no longer subject to death. Keep, uh, let's see, uh, go ahead. I'll put my spirit in you. Oh, uh, you read 13, right? Yes. All right, read 14 now, please. And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Now watch, he's talking about the day of Pentecost. This is the same prophecy that was made over in Ezekiel 36, 24, where he's going to give you a new heart and a new spirit, but this sets up even more. It talks about how he's going to put his spirit in you, and you will dwell in your own land. Now, I want to say something about that. Dr. Kinley was sitting with me one morning in his apartment in L.A., and he made the statement, he said, Dennis, did you know that Abraham walked the length and the breadth of Canaan's land, but never once set foot in the promised land? And I said, well, what are you talking about? I said, Doc, doesn't it say that right in Genesis that he was in the promised land? He goes, well, what, do me a favor. Would you find that for me and show it to me? And I said, sure. So I start thumbing through the book of Genesis. And all of a sudden, it hit me what he was talking about. And I looked up at him. I go, Doc, I got it. I got what you're saying. He said, did you catch it now? Then he went on to talk about that the land that we're going to dwell in is dwelling in Yahshua, being put within him. And that is the true promised land, that the physical Canaan's land was only a shadow, a type of shadow, an allegory to. Now, nobody was in the kingdom until the day of Pentecost. That's when all souls then can be translated, that are in the purpose to be translated, can be translated in the Holy Spirit. And that's the land we're going to dwell in. And that's really what this physical example that is being used here in Ezekiel is pointing to. So he talks about he will put you in your own land. Keep reading from there. Then shall ye know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, saith Yahweh. Go ahead. The word of Yahweh came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it. For Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. All right, now I want to talk about that for a minute because those sticks, what happened is down through the prophets, Israel got split up. They got split from 10 tribes and another part was two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, and the other 10 tribes, and they no longer uh, de dealt with one another and they had two kings at one point, one for Israel and one for Judah. Now, there was a split there, and that was due to, and I'm just going to say it real quick, that Solomon worshipped idols, so Yahweh rent the kingdom that he was king of because he did that. Now, what I want, and I don't want to get into that right now, so what I want to tell you is he's going to bring back together Judah and Israel. 
And he's also, when we read about Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. Now, Ephraim was part Gentile. His mother was an Egyptian. So Yahweh has planned all along to reunite those factions there uh, uh, of the uh, Israelites and, uh, uh, and Judah and then bring the Gentiles in as well. Now, we know that is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. The people were all coming into Jerusalem to celebrate the feast day of Pentecost that is set up, you read about it in the book of Leviticus. So that feast day, when they were in there, when Peter went out and began to preach the gospel, they were all hearing in their own tongue those things that Peter said. And why did that have to happen? Because at the Tower of Babel, Yahweh confused the tongues so that they wouldn't be able to understand each other. Now, to show that he's bringing them in, in a unified state, it didn't matter what their language was, they all heard it together. And this made them now become one in Yahshua. That's what's going on. And we know seven years after that, the Gentiles begin to come into the fold as well. So we see this unity because they were divided there at, at, uh, at the Tower of Babel. We see there was division there in the house of Abraham with the, uh, those that were uh, offspring, not of uh, Isaac, but others. He was going to bring factions all back together into Yahshua and become one. And that's why Paul writes that um, there is no longer male or female, Jew or Gentile in Yahshua for all are one. That's how we're being unified. That's how we can have in our organization old people, young people, smart people, people that don't have education, people that are black, people that are white, people that are uh, Chinese, Indian, it didn't matter. Uh, uh, all of us are being brought and made one in Yahshua the Messiah and fulfillment of this prophecy. Keep reading. Uh, 17. And join them one to another into one stick and they shall become one in thine hand. Mm -hmm. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Now listen, this is all Say happening after the preaching, uh, the two prophesying, the first and the second. So I'm showing you how that the preaching of the gospel is starting to bring this all back together. And how that uh, once the wind comes, which is the Holy Spirit enters into them, we will all stand together in the gospel of Yahshua, unified that we are, uh, he is our king, and we're in his kingdom. Now, I got to get down. I'm looking at my time here, and I want to go to, in this chapter, well, here in 24, he talks about, uh, no, it's 21, I'm sorry. Read 21. And say unto them, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the, na the nations, to which they are gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Now there you go. Just like what he says in Ezekiel thirty six twenty four, I will I will uh, gather I will call you know take you from amongst the heathen and bring you into your own land. It's repeating the same idea. Keep reading. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And that's Joshua. And they shall go ahead. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Keep reading. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. Mm -hmm. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their Elohim. And that's again in Ezekiel 30, uh, uh, 36, 24. So uh, it's a chapter before this where he tells him he's going to do these very things, and he's elaborating on it here. Keep reading. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in mine ordinances and observe my statutes and do them. Mm-hmm. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell in it, even they and their children and their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Now, he's not talking about David, King David back there. David, Yahshua's out of the lineage of David. He is referred to in some place as a son of David. Now, that 
David that is a type and a shadow, he was a king back there, a type and a shadow, is pointing to Yahshua. Yahshua is what David was a manifestation of. So he's talking about Yahshua here when he said uh, that they will dwell, uh, and my servant David will be their prince forever. Keep reading. That's Yahshua. Read. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Go ahead. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Now the tabernacle again <laughs> is Yahshua. He's the dwelling place of the cloud. Yahshua. So he's the tabernacle. He is, and listen, when you look at uh, the Moses chart, let me show you one thing. Go over to the Moses chart for a second for me, Greg. Now, do you see at the top there where Elohim, uh, we've all taught, been taught this, that Elohim transformed into that threefold intangible tabernacle, then back into himself, right? So we know that Elohim is the archetype original pattern of the universe, so the tabernacle is a figure of Elohim. Now, that was an in an un uh, intangible, meaning you couldn't touch a tabernacle up there. But he instructed Moses to build one down below. So what we have then is the tabernacle that comes down below that's put on the ground is a manifestation that Elohim, the Word, would dwell amongst us. The Word was made flesh and dwell amongst us. So we know that Yahshua is the Word that was made flesh. Therefore, Yahshua and the tabernacle are one in the same. He's the Word that was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Or in other words, Yahweh Elohim showed he was the tabernacle, and now the tabernacle has to be constructed in the physical. That sets up the witness in the law that Yahweh Elohim would manifest in the flesh, which was in Yahshua the Messiah. And so, uh, keep reading. And the heathen, or nations, shall know that I, Yahweh, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. All right. So here's what I'm trying to get you to see. Everything that Yahweh illustrated back there in types and shadows and allegories down through your Old Testament is pointing to a spiritual reality of the unity of the Spirit and the recipients of Yahweh's uh, great glory and, and mercy and kindness and salvation, eternal salvation to our souls. It's all a type and a shadow of what is happening now since the day of Pentecost. So he has to put away the manifestations uh, because there's the manifestations are already provided down through the law and the prophets. He doesn't have to now continue in manifestational worship. We have to go back to the law and the prophets to show those witnesses, that's what those manifestations are, of what the new covenant is and what the spiritual doctrine of Yahweh really is so that people can use that manifestation to comprehend Yahweh's doctrine, which is spiritual, so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what it's all about. So I'm just trying to put together for you this whole thing and show you how your soul was purposed by Yahweh to be put into the creation in captivity to the mystery of iniquity, only to be delivered by him and brought into your own land, which means to be put back in Yahshua. And Doc once put it like this. He said, when Eve was within Adam, she was, she was uh, protected. But once she came out of him, he said, then she fell prey to the devil. He said, now the way we got to fix that is we got to get the woman back in the man. Now we, our souls, are the bride of Yahshua. We are being put back into our husband that we came forth from to begin with. And we are being glorified in him. We are uh, uh, being covered with his righteousness. So we are, by purpose, Yahweh's souls that he is shedding his kindness and mercy on and glorifying us with his own self so that we might know his great, if you will, generosity and mercy towards us and kindness towards us. This is what it's trying to reveal is his own nature that is back in that state of what we call pure spirit that is now manifested through his purpose. So I hope some of this hit home. I hope it made some sense. 
I could have elaborated a lot more, but you know, some of these classes, we could take hours to break this stuff down. But I want to give you an overview. I want you to see how this thing works and catch on to it. I, I hope you got something out of it. And if anybody has, you know, any questions they want to ask me about some, any of the things I said tonight, feel free to contact me. And I'll be more than happy to try to answer them. With that, I'm going to turn it back to the moderator and wish all of you uh, a peace in Yahshua. And uh, let's just hold each other's arms up and fight this fight right down to the end because we got something great waiting for us at the close of this age. So with that, thank you so much for the opportunity. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Volpe. We'd like to thank everybody who joined us today on our Zoom class. And we'd also like to thank those who have viewed us on YouTube. We hold our Zoom class every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. At this time, I'd like to ask the class to stay muted until the live stream is ended. We'll now be dismissed by the doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.